Well, the summer gaming events are now underway in Los Angeles, and we actually saw that outside of one of the venues, we had this giant billboard, which kind of just highlights the disastrous time it has been for the AAA games industry the last year or so. So many jobs lost, so many beloved studios shut down. And Jeff Keighley actually opened up Summer Game Fest by addressing that. And the next two hours, there really wasn't much to show off. There was a lot of indie games, nothing wrong with that. There was a couple cool reveals. Uh, Cuff Bust, I think that's what it was called, and uh, Killer Bean are some of the highlight games. Kingdom Come 2 Deliverance also was a highlight, but it really, I guess my sentiment from the overall showcase was, I don't really know why they bothered, but hey, that's just me. Now in some other recent gaming news, because we have a lot of it, Larian recently talked about Baldur's Gate 3, and again talking about the scope, scale of it, and what it means for the future of the industry. This is an article coming from Arcade Sushi. Baldur's Gate 3 boss reckons The Witcher 4 and GTA 6 can dwarf what they have been doing. He says, I don't think we strike fear in the hearts of AAA developers. You shouldn't expect from somebody who has an indie budget that they're going to make a big AAA cinematic expansive RPG, and I don't think that was ever up for debate and i feel like other youtubers there is one specific i'm talking about like to twist what the narrative was going on surrounding Baldur's gate 3 and the whole controversy that happened last year but that wasn't ever at all the argument the argument was against other AAA studios like the biowars and bethesda's when we should be having experiences like Baldur's gate 3 but he did continue on the larian ceo saying you can be rest assured you guys have witcher 4 coming i'm sure that'll be fantastic you are going to see a whole bunch of other games that are going to be very huge like gta 6 that's also going to be massive and expensive they can dwarf what we've been doing and i would actually push back on that and say that yeah maybe there are a couple of games like that but a lot of the experiences coming from the triple a games industry feels like it's not up to par at least with the quality that we saw with with what uh, larian achieved now another studio that is actually having some bold ambitions in the future and also going against some of the narratives that have been going out there is arrowhead the developers behind hell divers 2 and they said that they do want to remain independent and achieve what from software or blizzard has achieved although hopefully more so the from software where uh, this was a recent comment coming from the former CEO saying we have to see what the future holds but there's nothing in the plans where we want to be acquired by somebody this coming after months of rumors that Sony was acquiring them I want to see how high we can fly and bringing this new CEO on board we have very good potential to realize that future of turning into the next from software or blizzard and at this point I think a lot of development studios definitely are very nervous about the idea of being acquired and for good reason as we've seen so many you know beloved studios being shut down by new parents companies and i'd certainly hope that arrowhead has a bright future again i hope it's more from software and maybe less blizzard elden ring shadow of the earth tree recently got a ton of previews and impressions and surprise surprise it's overwhelmingly positive a lot of reviewers previewers saying that it's comparable to the first hours of elden ring from what they experienced in their very short time that they had with the new dlc i'm not going to go any over any spoilers or too much about this but the reviews the previews were again they were glowing it was confirmed that there are 10 plus main bosses a bunch of additional side bosses the map is said to be more densely packed there's around 100 new weapons eight brand new weapon types and the dlc is said to be reportedly around 30 to 40 hours although from software said pretty much the same thing about the base game and as most of us have experienced it's much much longer especially with all the deaths that are factored into it now after the fallout tv show there have been a lot of questions about the future of well fallout and todd howard recently sat down with variety talking about the franchise and he again reiterated that they have some plans for new fallout experiences it's nothing earth shattering but people have been getting excited and i think people really need to look into what he exactly said here he said the tv show i feel like it took us 15 years from when I first started talking about it, but it was five years since Jonah and I first talked, Todd Howard said, and games take a good five-ish years, so we're in plans for future games in the series, and nothing to talk about right now, but we're always planning. In the past, we heard that uh, Obsidian Entertainment was exploring the idea of making a spin-off type game, like another Fallout New Vegas. We also have seen some leaked reports, like from the FTC trial with Activision Blizzard, that showed that Bethesda was planning, at least at some point, a Fallout 3 remaster, so those are two potential you know future roads besides you know the inevitable fallout 5 in like five to ten years probably closer to 10 years at this point but i definitely feel like we're going to have some new fallout games it's just the question of when and the problem is that game development is taking longer than ever and that big part that a lot of people need to remember five-ish years is probably realistic for a new fallout experience not fallout 5 but even just a spin-off if it was start if it was to start development today or tomorrow now speaking to much of the chaos of the AAA games industry and so many layoffs again it has continued as the just cause maker avalanche announced that 50 more layoffs were happening and they were closing 
only two studios. Roughly 9% of its workforce is being cut. Again, this comes at a time in which in the last year or two, we've had more than 20,000 jobs in this industry lost. It really is just a nightmarish time to be developing games. Now in December, something very big happened. A lot of you may have noticed this, but Grand Theft Auto 6's debut trailer got leaked early, and there have been many question marks about what the heck happened, how did it happen, and now it's becoming abundantly clear, as it looks like this is a problem within YouTube, in which those that have admin privilege are able to see unpublished, scheduled, premiered videos ahead of time, and they're leaking them and selling it off to those who I guess are interested in buying. And that's exactly what happened with GTA 6, it's what's been happening with Nintendo showcases apparently it's what happened with the recent playstation state of play and youtube has launched a number of investigations and they have gone absolutely nowhere so i feel like this is a warning to the AAA games industry if you have a big announcement there could be repercussions by uh, uploading the video early and scheduling it on youtube Amidst all of the layoffs and studio shutdowns happening in the AAA games industry, especially in regards to Xbox, this was an eye-opening one as Activision recently opened a new Polish studio called Elsewhere to develop narrative-based and genre-defining AAA franchises. Again, this came just a week or two after the announcement that Tango Gameworks, Arcane Austin, and a number of other studios at Xbox were being shut down. Definitely something that a lot of people were like, what, what's happening here? What's the point? But I think I think it's just genuinely showing that Xbox has more interest maybe in reviving some of the Activision Blizzard franchises that are dormant, maybe like a prototype, maybe Hexen or something. So they open this studio, maybe that's something we'll see in the coming years, but it's quite clear that Xbox is still interested in, you know, opening and maybe managing new studios. But I guess for those other Bethesda studios, Tango and Arcane Austin, that were probably going to be working on smaller, more niche projects, I guess there just wasn't an interest in keeping them around. And more so, they want to keep studios like this around hopefully to make or form the next big franchise for Xbox. Blizzard has to be one of the most frustrating game developers, publishers in this industry. Overwatch 2 had a lot of anticipation behind it when it was announced, and over the last couple of years, it's just been completely squandered, as we've seen numerous veterans depart from the company. And this new PC Gamer article just points to a lot of, what was the point of Overwatch 2? I mean, we already kind of had that sentiment that's been felt for a while now, especially once they canceled all the PvE content, but even the PvE content that has remained there's just no interest at all in it because it's just it's pve content that exists and there's no actual quality behind it like it's not good uh, as pc gamer article says after only four months blizzard will axe one of overwatch 2's last pve modes because it hasn't resonated with players in the ways that we hoped as the article goes on to say one of the few Overwatch 2 co-op PvE modes, Hero Mastery Gauntlet, will be removed the next season due to a lack of interest. I mean, you advertise, you get people excited about this grand PvE experience, and then you pull the rug from them, and then you give them pretty much dog shit in return. What do you what do you expect from players? Do you think they're actually going to be interested in caring about the dog shit? No. Uh, Hero Mastery Gauntlet was intended to bring the high score chasing excitement of Hero Mastery missions in a way multiplayer format. A community manager wrote, "Unfortunately, it hasn't resonated with players in the way that we hoped." Compared to the solo Hero Mastery mode, which is essentially a growing list of obstacle courses for individual heroes, Hero Mastery Gauntlet never really caught on with the community. It has nothing to do with Overwatch 2's story, nor does it have any sort of progression systems like the skill trees Blizzard scrapped with the Hero mode last year. It's a mode for a very niche set of high-skilled groups who want to grind the same thing over and over for some small cosmetic rewards, which just isn't worth it for most players. That it's being removed after only four months speaks to Overwatch 2's confusing approach to PvE after abandoning most of his ambitions for the sequel. And that's pretty much summarizes what's happening with Overwatch 2 and the grand scope that it had for the sequel, which kind of never never transpired. Rainbow Six Siege is one of the big live services of today, and like many of these live services, they need to continue to, you know, boost up the revenue and make more and more money, so another monetization opportunity was introduced. Now, this is also another live service that has been lacking new content as of late, so announcing more monetization, definitely not something that, you know, the overall gaming community is going to be extremely happy by. And the article says, a new subscription service for Siege called R6 Membership promises exclusive content drops, animated skins, and premium battle pass access for $10 per month. And you want to know the reaction? Well, we have actually some video of it when it was announced in... <laughs> So how does it 
Each month, as a member, you will have access to the premium dollar pass along with its privileges. It comes in the form of a 10% share discount and a 30% I think that's the the way that a lot of people just feel about all of these, you know, battle passes that are introduced to these existing live services. It's total rubbish, total nonsense. And uh, it was also mentioned by another big YouTuber that on top of zero new content coming this new season, plus the membership, Ubisoft is also removing the free battle pass option from the game. It's Chalked Boys Call It. And uh, the PC Gamer article does go on to mention the fact that the reaction isn't much better on other places such as Reddit. A lot of people extremely upset. And there was also apparently individuals within that TikTok video of when it was announced called saying robbing bastards which uh all you need to know and this is ubisoft and they do do without a lot of that as of late perhaps one of the biggest most anticipated games of all time was cyberpunk 2077 it had a horrific launch disastrous it had its own documentary made about how horrible it went down there's a lot of lies made by cd project red and they spent the last couple of years fixing that and they also released a great expansion and the, the reception perception surrounding cdpr and cyberpunk 2077 has come around if you actually check steam reviews i think it's almost over 90 percent positive now so a lot of people extremely happy with what cyberpunk 2077 has become and for the first time it does appear that cdpr has completely moved on from the experience as this games radar article says 12 years after its original announcement cyberpunk 2077 has no developers left working on it but the rpg series is definitely not dead obviously because cdpr opened a boston studio and they've already begun work on a new cyberpunk game cyberpunk 2084 whatever it's going to be called Called. we'll probably get that soon after maybe five or so years uh, obviously attention right now at the studio is on the new witcher installment but we also have this other article saying that the witcher 4 is the largest game in development at cd project by the size of the team but also by the progress of ongoing work and then another article coming from vgc cdpr uh, says it wants to release major games more frequently again this goes with probably us seeing a new cyberpunk game maybe in five or so years assuming that we see a new witcher game maybe before then a couple of years beforehand uh within the article it says uh this is from a financial call when a cdpr's executive saying we're working on more than one project at the time as well there's cyberpunk 2 being developed in boston there's polaris being developed predominantly here in europe and obviously we have other projects with uh teams like project Sirius, also in boston with the molasses flood and there's the witcher 1 remake done in cooperation with canis majoris so so you can definitely expect us to release more titles and the cadence of launches is something we definitely plan to increase, although I will obviously not comment on what is this space between the project time-wise. Now a massive story that went viral the last week is quotes that came from Neil Druckmann, or quotes that we assume that came from Neil Druckmann, in which a lot of people felt like the Naughty Dog CEO or the head of the company was being narcissistic. Uh, this is an article coming from VGC. Neil Druckmann says new Naughty Dog title could redefine mainstream perceptions of gaming and a lot of people just just rolled their eyes at those remarks but the issue with this specific quote is that that's not at all what he said he never at all said that and Sony actually had to come out and they had to apologize. They even deleted the original uh, interview because they are the ones that conducted this interview. And it was a lengthy quote that Neil Druckmann said. It never actually said those specific remarks and they just put words in his mouth. I guess they thought it would sound good. It didn't. It made him look bad. And he had to come out and say, yeah, I, I never said this. And ultimately they did apologize to Neil Druckmann following, yeah, a heavily edited interview, but I feel like the damage has been done. Neil Druckmann, one of those gaming figures that is just very, very, very controversial and another bad look although i don't think that this is going to be changing any perceptions about him the fact that the quote you know wasn't real. Now with the whole Helldivers 2 PSN controversy that we discussed a couple of weeks ago Sony put out a very interesting tweet in which they went back on things and they said that they were still learning what's best for PC players and the weeks that have come it's quite clear that they didn't learn jack shit. We already kind of saw that with Ghost of Tsushima when that released on PC as that had a PSN requirement and now we are seeing that future single player games are going to have that same requirement so Sony definitely just they didn't want the controversy with Helldivers 2 to continue. They appeased the PC audience for the time being, but long term, this is their strategy. This is their plan. They want the data for whatever reason. They want players to have PSN accounts. This was announced during uh, Sony's recent state of play that God of War Ragnarok and the Until Dawn remake were coming to Steam. However, according to the respective store pages on Steam in the Epic Game Store, both games require a PSN account in order to play them. And I know some people 
look at this and they respond, who cares? It's just a PSN account. Well, the problem is, well, here's Ghost of Tsushima's restrictions. Territories and places which the game is no longer, it's not available. You can't purchase it because there is no PSN it's just not available in those countries and it is many it's around 100 different territories and countries and this is going to continue to be a problem and continue to be something that is met to outrage and controversy as a lot of people in countries like latvia egypt and such are extremely upset that they just do not have the option on pc to play these games and you know what the answer to that is well people resorting to put their pirate caps on and i don't you really can't say anything about that because they don't even have an option legally to play these games. Now, I will also go over that Sony has had some other issues as of late. This was a hilarious one, in my opinion. Sony talking about their PC strategy, which has pretty much been, you know, they're going to release their live services on there as soon as they can. And then the premium single player experiences will probably come down the line later on. And Herman Holst, the soon to be co-CEO of Sony's PlayStation business, he addressed day one PC releases, saying that live service games will come day and date on PC, PS5 and PC, but single-player narrative games on PC are designed to then entice PC owners to play sequels on a PlayStation console, which is not happening. It's a total, it's a silly remark that he made there at the end. They were talking about the PC strategy. Nothing is at all changing with that, but that last part, people aren't going to spend $500. They'll just wait it out, uh, especially for inferior hardware, as many individuals have high-end PCs, and that's where they want to play these games on. And Sony is bringing these experiences later on for, you know, the PC. PC audience, it's just taking some time, and it does seem like PC players are okay with, you know, waiting. Now, some other Sony news is Days Gone's director recently again took aim at Sony. I will forever say that I prefer Days Gone over a game like Horizon Zero Dawn or Horizon Forbidden West. I really don't get the love over that experience and how so many different products are on the way for that, and it's just so disappointing to me that Days Gone never got a sequel because while the story had some issues within it, I thought the gameplay was excellent and it really had room to improve with the sequel but that opportunity will never come. And Days Gone's director recently said that Sony's executives were never fans, hence no sequel. And specifically, the game director, Jeff Ross, one of the senior team members who worked on the game, said, A lot of people still ask me if there will ever be a Days Gone sequel, so I submit this poster as evidence it will never happen. Sony higher-ups like Herman were never fans, so you won't hear about it at the PlayStation State of Play today or ever, which is extremely disappointing because, I, again, just I feel like out of any of the zombie games we've had the last half decade or even the last decade this was the one that really hit me and it really worked and there was there really was a future for this franchise i guess sony just didn't believe in it warner brothers is a company that is in trouble it doesn't seem like they have a great grasp on the direction that they want to take with their games they seem to be doubling down on areas that make absolutely no sense especially when a game just cost them 200 million dollars with how much of a failure it was a live service title i should say but it looks like one of the more uh anticipated games at least it's anticipated in my eyes monolith wonder woman game which is supposed to be featuring the nemesis system it's apparently in a troubled state this is a recent report coming from greg miller of kind of funny games he recently said this on the kind of funny gamecast in the following remarks you mm -hmm. want the exclusive do, i'll give you my jeff grubb information all right oh in the past year because <laughs> i'll leave it ambiguous i have talked to an insider who was like this game's troubled that's it that's wonder all i'll woman. say yeah so I don't hold out hope that it's in a place to show something. And I think you could be. You could come out. Obviously, plenty of games are doing And again, what does troubled actually mean? That, that It's not like I got like, oh, man, people we are falling through level four or some shit like that. But it's like, I, I think it's not where they want it to be. I don't think it's ready for prime time. And then I go to, what the fuck is WB doing? What yeah. do they want to do? What are they trying to do with these games? I, again, I, I... And I think this, again, goes back to the point that I made a second ago. It's the fact that Warner Brothers really does not know what they want to do with these games. They want to maximize profits by jumping into the live service arena, and yet what they've been producing is laughable, and it does feel like uh, a lot of these studios, like Monolith Productions and what we saw with Rocksteady, they just are ill-prepped for live service games. Pushing single-player developers to jump into that space, it just has not worked at all not necessarily just with warner brothers but this entire triple a games industry and they continue going down these road these uh, video game executives and the results just are not changing and i feel like if that's exactly what's going to be happening with warner brothers uh with wonder woman i'm extremely nervous now speaking of suicide squad the developers the founders of rocksteady recently made a deal with xbox they reached an agreement with the arkham trilogy creators for a new triple a game this is an article coming from Exputer, and it says that the 
studio is working on its first ever project, a AAA action adventure single player game. They're going back to their roots, the things that they they're comfortable with. Uh, the article goes on to say that uh, the co-founders Sefton Hill and Jamie Walker branded together to form a new AAA games making studio last year called Hundred Star, which is headquartered in La- London. And then they are working on again on their first project, an action adventure game built in Unreal Engine Five. It'll probably be a couple of years before we see that, but it looks like it'll be something coming first to Xbox. Now, it does need to mention that Suicide Squad has been. It's a travesty. It really is a laughable mess. It's a game that we all kind of knew was going to be a disaster, but I think a lot of it is expected to be a little bit better than what it was. I think Marvel's Avengers is actually even better than what, you know, Rocksteady produced, that which says a lot because that game released a couple of years ago, and you would have thought that they learned something from it, but they didn't. And uh, this is an upcoming season of Miss Freeze, and oh my god, what am I looking at? I think that's... Uh, I say that a lot in regards to what Suicide Squad has produced, especially the content, as we've talked about on the channel over the last number of months. But right now, if you actually check the Steam DB, Steam Charts has a hundred players. This is a massive AAA experience. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars, eight years developing it. It has a hundred players. This is supposed to be a, a grand live service experience that went on for years to come. It doesn't look like it even has a couple of months left before they shut everything down. And we did have a recent expose. This is coming from Jason. And Schreier at Bloomberg, and it kind of is all the obvious stuff. I mean, this is the same stuff that we've heard with Anthem, same stuff we heard with Marvel's Avengers, Fallout 76, Redfall, all of these giant live service failures. It's the same problems, same issues, and nobody learning anything because this AAA games industry, as I've said over the years, they just never learn. On May 9th, during an earnings call, Warner Brothers revealed that it was taking a $200 million loss on Suicide Squad, making it one of the gaming world's worst blunders. Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League was a tumultuous affair plagued by countless delays. The game failed for a number of reasons, said the people, including a constantly shifting vision, a culture of rigid perfectionism, and a genre pivot that was ill-suited for the studio. Again, Rocksteady had no business working on a game like this, but yet... They continued down this road for eight years, and the results speak for themselves. Uh, the article goes on to add that following Rocksteady's third and final installment, which came out in 2015, the studio's co-founders, eager to do something different, started working on a prototype of an original multiplayer puzzle-solving game codenamed Stones. Around the end of 2016, they told their staff that they had a change of plan. Stones was out. Suicide Squad was in. At the time, the broader industry was growing increasingly fixated on games as a service. You know exactly where this is going such as Destiny and League of Legends, which generate sales long after the initial release, blah, 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 armed with a battery of presentations, Warner Brothers executives, yes, those damn executives that know nothing about the gaming industry, traveled to London and made the case that the growing category was the industry's future. So they didn't outright say they had to do it, but they definitely pushed them in that direction. So Rocksteady executives soon decided that in keeping with their parent company's newfound enthusiasm, Suicide Squad would become an online multiplayer game with live service content. Over time, the leader's vision kept morphing, most notably switching from an emphasis on melee combat to heavily focused on guns. Again, this was something that we all watched the original gameplay presentations and we just didn't understand any of it. And it appears even Rocksteady developers had no idea what they were doing here. Uh, The change left some staff members wondering why protagonists such as Captain Boomerang, known for fighting with his namesake weapon, would suddenly pivot to gunplay. Uh, It goes on to mention that at one point, Hill pitched an elaborate system of vehicles that would allow players to deck out cars with weapons and navigate through the game's alien-infested streets. Apparently, they worked on this aspect for a couple of months, and it went nowhere. Just showing the vision, their uh, feelings with the games, it just, it was a mess. It was all over the place. Leadership didn't seem worried, though, with the the project, they say, even as other traditionally single-player game studios that chased the live service trend were delivering abysmal results. Apparently, they just never learned anything from those failures. Despite the internal concerns among frontline workers, executives from Warner Brothers, apparently, they kept reviewing demonstrations of the game and sending laudatory feedback praising the graphics and saying they expected suicide squad to become a billion dollar franchise which just shows that these gaming executives are so out of touch they have no idea what they're talking about and last but not least it does say that many of the studio's employees are now helping to develop a new director's cut version of hogwarts legacy at the same time according to people familiar the studio leaders are looking to pitch a new single player game which would return rocksteady to its roots and then an analyst at TD Cohen says, I think they'll definitely get another 
another at bat, hopefully with something more aligned with their demonstrated talents, which ultimately should have been the case from the get go. This was a mistake, uh, a mistake from all the way top down. It just made no sense for Rocksteady to be making this game. They had no business doing it. And yet here we are eight years later, they could have been making some great single player experiences during that span of time. But no, we got Suicide Squad, which is just laughable in so many different regards and a probably one of the biggest video game failures of all time. Anywho, summer gaming events, summer game reveals, and tons of summer gaming news. A lot to discuss, much of what we talked about today, and going to have a lot more in the coming weeks. But let me know your thoughts on all the stories we discussed down in the comment section below. Thank you for watching. Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this video or if you found any informative value, and consider subscribing for a lot more videos like this, and I'll see you later.